Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, finally, uh, three wonderful guests from uh, Intel Research. Um, Yatin, Shabata, Jeffrey Hightower, and Anthony Lamarca. And um, I actually did a wonderful talk at Intel a couple of, couple of weeks ago and um, was hanging out with all these people. And um, I just felt like this is, I need to know more about this. And I was very excited about the, um, the project. And um, so, um, so John and I are actually co-hosting these people together. And they're going to talk about Place Lab. And um, actually, who's going to give the talk is going to be Jeff today. But this is shared work with, uh, with Yat and, and uh, Anthony and other people, as you see. Uh, Sunny is involved and a couple of other people, Ian Smith. And um, so uh, Place Lab is, is very related to stuff that, that actually happens at Microsoft Research as well, which is what John Cummins is working on, location tracking, in one case inside buildings, in, one ca in the other case um, more like on a, on a broader scale. And I think it's really exciting stuff. So take it away. Thanks. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm Jeff Hightower. I'll be uh, telling you all today about the, some of the work we've been doing in location-enhanced computing, and particularly uh, our, our take on it of pushing for looking at the theory that a, a location system that has very high coverage that works, you know, works uh, throughout your daily life has a potential value even at the trade-off of a little bit of accuracy. That's the basic theme for this. Um, so first, a little bit, in case you're not familiar, a little bit about uh, uh, where we come from. Um, we're over there just across on the other side of the lake next to UW. Um, there's a, a, the Intel Research Lab over there. We, uh, the mission of this particular lab is proactive ubiquitous computing. Um, we work really closely with UW. We have a number of uh, visiting faculty, interns, students uh, in and out. Um, we're about 17 researchers growing up to 20, and there's a big community kind of around this, and we're the top couple floors of that building there. And there are other similar labs uh, nearby attached to Berkeley, attached to uh, uh, Cambridge in England, and attached to CMU at Pittsburgh. Um, the brief slide, what we do at this lab is this proactive computing vision that had been laid out by David Tenenhouse, which is systems kind of acting in anticipation of future needs. Some of this, you know, if you've been around ubiquitous computing, there's a lot of th this kind of good work that's gone on here in the past, too. This is a uh, old, old hat. So uh, in particular, we always break this down as we're interested in the who, the where, and the what of this. And currently, we're focusing on the where and the what in our lab. And what we're going to tell you about today is the where. <laughs> I think that's enough. I think that's enough introduction there. Let's get, let's get on with the the work we're here to talk about today. So we would argue, and many people would agree, that location is a pretty key enabler of future mobile platforms. That uh, There's a lot of applications that are starting to have an interest in location. There's a lot of nice things you can do with computing devices if they're aware of where they are and where they've been, where they might be in the future. From simple things like automatically setting the clock of your laptop as it migrates between time zones to more complicated things about you know, doing health care and aging in place in the home by knowing, having, being able to share where grandma is and where she was and where she went for the day and who she visited and so forth. Um, so one interesting observation about this is, is that in, a, in order to sort of realize this vision of location as part of the platform, we believe that the location system, it should be able to run on commodity devices. It should have a, have a good privacy story that goes with it, so to enable it to be used by everyone. And then this is the big one we've been focusing on, is that it should work 24-7 wherever we take our devices. You know, if you've got something like a great new IM client that you can use and you can say, I, well, I'm going to set my IM in a mode where it sets my status message, say, for where I am at a, at a given time. Well, you know, if that only works well within a particular building or on a particular campus, that's l much less interesting to me, whereas if, if it works 24-7 wherever I go in my daily life. So let me give you a couple of, uh, of uh, demos of this here. 
just to motivate this. And so, uh, well, I should say that the thesis of this work is that high coverage has value even at the expense of a little accuracy. A lot of the work that's come so far, because accuracy is an easy, as measured by, as in, an easy metric to get your hand around, get your head around. So a lot of people focus on, well, let's make the system very, very, very accurate at the expense of you know, coverage. And we're kind of pushing the other way with this work. So let me give you a couple of demos here to, to illustrate how this works. Ah. So, so we have a, so I have a, a notebook computer up here, and it is running the our Place Lab software, and so it knows where it is, and so this enables us to do a couple of little cool things. I'm going to give a couple of high-level demos, and then I'll dive in and talk about all the technology and the al analysis we've done, and and kind of go back and forth between this. So if we have a notebook computer that somehow knows where it is, which this one does at the moment. It's running the Place Lab software. We can do things like, you know, you can link into TerraServer and it automatically brings up and I guess that's where we are. We're somewhere right about there, you know, because the laptop knows where it is. It can go out and we, one of the interfaces we have is a, is a web proxy service that can just annotate the location information on where you go and that's there and indeed if I take this laptop and I, you know, walk over to Azteca or some other place and I hit F5, it'll recenter this map exactly, exactly where we go again. Um, of course, you can do the same kind of thing with other web mapping surface, for example, here's the Here's MapQuest. I guess that's about where we are out in the middle of that open, open field there. <laughs> um, you can do other interesting things like uh, you can take web search and uh, augment it by, take your search term and augment it by uh, uh, current location query. A lot of uh, search, including uh, Google and Yahoo and I guess MSN search does this now too, have this, have this location capability. Well, you know, this will allows you the simple way to do this automatically. So, you know, you want to know pizza around here. The, I guess these are around here. There's, somebody mentioned something that they'd been to Chuck E. Cheese. Maybe they'd taken their, taken their kids there around here in the past. Um, my favorite query, Wicca. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, if you want to know about you know, Wicca and uh, the, the, the cult that that is, you can find out nearby places where you can go discover about that. Uh, <laughs> And yeah, there's a, there's a number of other things here. You can do, do searches and, and links to businesses and everything. Let me see. Let me go back to the slides here. All right. So uh, now let's let's get down into the the technology and the comparison here a little bit. So what's come before? Well, there's been a number. Of, there's been a lot of technologies that have that have looked at location. The most common one that everybody knows is GPS. And GPS is a fabulous technology. It has really high coverage as measured by the percent of the Earth's surface that it works on. And it it works outdoors and it works fabulously for navigation. You can get trucks and cars and hikers and stuff to where they, they need to go. Now, the, of course, the problem with GPS is in urban canyons and in buildings, it's completely blind because it needs a clear view of the sky and it needs to be able to see satellites. So it works for what it works for. But as for you and me in our regular day, if we have a GPS device, it's less useful to us if it only works, you know, four or five percent of the time while we're, you know, commuting or even in the cars, it often doesn't work if you're under the roof. Sometimes, so there's, another, there's a lot of other location systems. This what we call things that operate roughly in the domain of process management, where you put a location system on a campus or in a hospital because you want to know where the patients are and where the doctors go and where this defib unit is and how to how to organize all this stuff. So there's a variety of ultrasonic infrared badge systems. There's 802.11 fingerprinting radar, which is an MSR research project, was kind of the classic example of that. Now there's commercial companies like Ekahau and others who, who do this. And th th again, this is largely good for what it does, but it gives you focuses on a very accurate, very easy to use location system that's installed in a single locale, a building, a campus, something like that. You have uh, cellular triangulation, which just actually gets us a lot of the way to what we're talking about. I mean, this is, this is a, a location system that knows, thanks to the, you know, the E911 stuff here in the US and the E112 uh, initiative that's similar in Europe, where cell providers have to be able to know where a cell phone is within certain accuracy bounds that are actually fairly high, 100 to 200 meters. They have to be able to do that for the purpose of 911 calls, but they can sell that information to you for other things. Now, the, 
this actually gets a long way to this to the, the vision we have in mind of having high coverage because you know cell phone networks are everywhere you know or get they're getting that way and so you can have that now the problem with this so far is that this largely falls in the application domain of what we call fee based transactions because right now they're trying to you know milk all the money they can out of this the prov they being the providers and so you know getting your location costs about a dollar a query right now on average if you look around the around the world um, and that's pretty expensive and that can be fairly limiting as far as the, the types of applications I mean if you're wanting to do something proactive that involves hitting the location at four Hertz you're gonna rack up a pretty big bill pretty quick there so we think there's a, another opportunity here and, and we're not the, we're not the only ones who have have believed this here for using beacon based location which is taking advantage of the the natural radio beacons in the wild I'll get into this a lot more and we think this is going to enable this new class of 24 7 mobile computing which is a uh, new opportunity for applications there so place lab is in this space as well as uh, some of the the right spot work here at uh, here at MSR on uh, has, is also in this space so I mentioned this radios and radio beacons. Let's get into this a little more. So the observation is that most new mobile computing platforms have wireless networking, and a lot, often they have multiple wireless networks. You know, a ABG, Bluetooth, GSM. There's things like WiMAX and Zigbee and other things that are coming down the pipe. Um, now the infrastructure is, is building out even more rapidly with these technologies. And we believe that this confluence will enable beacon-based location. So here's a number of the devices here. Here's a shot of you know, over across the water in downtown Seattle. These are some of the access points you see down there. Now these actually are not the uh, 802.11 access points. These are actually the GSM towers in downtown Seattle. These are the 802.11 access points in downtown Seattle. So you can see there's an awful lot of density here. And uh, this, this is a motivation to, that led us to believe that we can use this as a, as, as for, to be able to do this location with high coverage. So what's the basic idea with PlaySat? The basic idea is pretty simple, and the, the, the complexity is in the analysis and in the details. So the basic idea is you have this device, you have radios in the environment around you, they have a certain range, they propagate, you can see these beacons. Now the, the thing that's interesting is all these radio sources we've talked about so far, they all have a unique or a semi-unique ID assigned to them. So I can hear an 802.11a access point say and it has a unique ID. In this case it's a MAC address. And I can see that and I say, if, oh, if I see that beacon then I know I must be somewhere near that beacon. Because the radio, you know, if, if, if that beacon is in downtown Seattle, I'm not going to hear it over here in uh, Redmond. So it has to be, I have to know that I'm in downtown Seattle if I hear that. And that's the basic idea of PlaySlab. Now as it gets more complicated you can hear multiple beacons and you could do some various levels of cleverness in the algorithms to, de to uh, increase the accuracy that you achieve. But another point to make with this is we're, we can just use the beacon frame. So for example, if we see a this access point somewhere in the world that it's the Bank of Zurich and it's encrypted and it, it has web encryption on it and everything, that's just fine for PlaySlab. We don't need to be able to connect to the network. We don't need to be able to listen to the network traffic or send data packets or anything. We can just listen to, in this case with 802.11, it's just the, uh, the beacon frame messages that contain the unique ID. You can also do this with uh, GSM cell towers. They contain a more or less semi-unique ID. If you know, if you can hear those, you can do that. And you can, oop, hit B. And you can even do it with uh, Bluetooth also. So you can listen for Bluetooth in the environment, say printers, parking meters, things like that that exist around the environment. And they all have different range characteristics and there's different things of these radios. So the question you might be asking is, of course, to know where you are, basically, if you just hear a beacon and you don't know anything about that beacon, you know, that doesn't tell you much. You have to have some idea of, I hear this beacon and I know this beacon is at this latitude and longitude or I have an estimate of where it might be at the, at, in a particular place. And then you can do that mapping back. So some of the complexity is in how do we get this database, where does it come from, how is it built up, how is it maintained, and we'll talk about that. So basic idea the here then is place is pretty simple. We store and update this radio database. The device can go around and scan for radio sources and we combine the observations sensibly for what we'll show you is multiple definitions of sensibly. There's some interesting ways to do that. And one interesting thing to point out here at this point is that there, another thing that emerges from this approach is it has a pretty darn good privacy story, at least at the top level, because the device can at least theoretically listen entirely passively and just hear the beacons. 
And then you can make the choice whether to, once your location is computed, whether or not you want to reveal that location to others. So it, it, it provides a similar privacy story to what GPS has, wherein you just listen. Yeah, we have a question. Two, uh, two, two, two things. One is, as best I know, pretty much all radio receivers are super heterodynes. Yes. So if you listen, if you listen hard enough, you're going to find <coughs> who's listening. The crystal and cat whisker things are just right. And the other thing is, uh, cell phones keep saying, "I'm here, I'm here, yeah. here." So a third party could tell where, uh, tell you where you are, even if you can't tell where you are. Right. So uh, the, uh, this is exactly the next caveat that that I, I was going to say is that yeah, there is there is different modalities to these radios. Y y exactly. All the all the ra the radios you can tell where someone's tuned to if you have the right gear and you can you can listen appropriately. So it's not. I mean, we're not going for like a cryptographically secure privacy story here. I mean, the the idea is that 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 at the, at the basic level this provides us. And of course cell phones, you know, if you have a cell phone, if you're using it for, for this, of course the cell phone is going to connect to the network too and the provider already knows you where you are. So the story here is that we're not making this any worse than the devices that people are already carrying around with them. We're not adding something where suddenly we're continually reporting, broadcasting your location to the world. Well, so. And then a caveat here is that we're not introducing a new hole. I mean, I was down, not name names, but you know, I was down at San Diego and you know, they run the active campus system and, and they said, oh, look at this demo, see that's cool, you see that? That's a trace of everybody in the system and where they are right now. And this was a display sitting in a public lab, yep. just scrolling by. And so, you know, it's one thing for me to trust AT&T because I have a business relationship, I, you know, I can sue them you know, into oblivion. It's another thing to tell people, hey, we're gonna force you to trust us with your location and don't worry, we'll only disclose it to the people you. I recall it in, in Britain, for instance, they check people who don't pay their TV license fees by listening to the super. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so uh, it's it's yeah. I, I think well, let's let's just move on from there. I think that I think that that's a good discussion. We can. I'm happy to talk about this more offline. We have a, a number of things we can point you to about privacy studies that we've done with this as well. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about sort of three major areas of contributions. The, the first two I'm going to talk about in some detail, the, the, the toolkit that we've built particularly to do this, and then some analysis we did that characterized the important relationship between accuracy, coverage, and beacon density that you actually find out in the wild. Then I'm going to talk about some, in, in slightly less detail, other research we've done, including comparing s several algorithms. This is a collaboration actually with John Crone and uh, a particular social mobile application, some of the investigations we've done there, and some work we've actually done in uh, doing a be the Beacon Data database as peer-to-peer, -peer, as a peer-to-peer -peer distributed database. And then finally, I'll end with some work that's sort of future work and in-progress work on self-mapping and location to place, and I'll get into exactly what that is. Another question in the back. Um, shouldn't there be a fourth item on their second bullet? So there's accuracy, coverage, beacon density, and then there's a beacon churn, right? People take down access points, put in new access points, um, change the cloud. That is exactly another parameter, and that actually, we'll get into this a little bit down here. Um, that is another important parameter. The, uh, this is exactly what we did study here. We also have some results in the white paper. Yeah, and yeah, exactly, and there's some results in here, definitely on on churn. It's a huge factor. Yeah, it is a huge factor. It is an important factor. Yeah. So first, let's talk about the toolkit. What does this thing do? How does it actually work? What's where does the rubber hit the road? Um, so this is the basic architecture. It's pretty simple. You have this beacon database that exists. You have the mobile platform with a, uh, a software layer running in there. And this is, all, this is an all in the software layer. And so you have this beacon database position. Now there's multiple sources you can get. You can fill this database with this mapping from unique ID to lat long. There are service providers like, like Jiwire, T-Mobile, Starbucks, you know, or I guess uh, Starbucks might be an intermediary there. But there are, are service providers that have an idea of where their access points are. That's one source. There's internal departments like IT might have a, an idea of where all their access points are. There's um, this interesting group called War Drivers. Now these are... Uh, these are people who go around with a GPS unit and a laptop and you know, they drive around and they, they map out where access points are. Now they're doing it for the purpose of you know, basically where can, you, where can you go to steal wireless networking? Where can you go to connect to someone's network? And there's even an extension of this called, called well, I'll, I'll get into this on the next slide. But, um, so that, there are one group there. I have more details on this on the next slide. And then the last way you can fill this database is to use the location system itself to feed back. And we call this self-mapping. We'll get into all these in a little more detail. Now, the PlaceLab Toolkit provides a number of, of interfaces in there. There's, you can link directly to it. You can, we implement all the sort of standard location interfaces like the Java, J, 
JSR 179 location interface. We provide a, uh, a virtual GPS port, which I was going to actually demonstrate right here. Come on here. So, yeah. So, for example, we, you know, we implement this virtual GPS port so you can say, you know, um, tools, track position. And uh, nice product. that's exactly where we're at. <laughs> and the, what, what this demonstrates is that, you know, we're, we're, just, we're just exporting, you know, NMEA sentences just like GPS does. So, basically, this is like a GPS that sort of starts to work indoors. And it's, uh, it, it makes it work with, I don't want to call them legacy products, but it makes them work with existing, <laughs> the, the, the large existing, it's a, it's a well-known interface. I mean, people know how to use this interface. We have a question from yeah, here. Yeah, uh, you're doing your, your initial mapping. Uh, what kind of tools do you have that say maybe the actual device uh, wouldn't have? Do you have directional um, antennas that you can uh, do triangulation if you don't have ingress to the, to the particular building that the beacon comes from? So we... In general, we've, we've tried not to use, you know, these directional arrays of antennas and things like that to, to take advantage of this. We've tried to, because a lot of this data that we're using, you can certainly use those things. And we can certainly integrate that stuff if you have it. But we've tried, a lot of these traces come from, for example, the war driving community who aren't using those things. So we've largely focusing on, focused on developing techniques that work with the data that we can actually get. So... Um, yeah, we, we do have a story for, you know, we'll drive around using uh, like a high gain antenna or something to be able to see more of them and model that appropriately. Well, I, I think the short answer though is that no, we don't do triangulation. We basically rely on seeing from more than one angle. Right. And if you don't and you just see from the road, then you actually don't know if it's on the left side of the road or the right side of the road. And we represent but, that uncertainty. But, but you only have to do that once or hopefully once right. per. Right. And so, more importantly, if, what, some, uh, if, if you do it naively, you use one uh, kind of antenna for train for your training data set and another antenna when you're actually using the system, you can have a lot of issues. So uh, we did some uh, basic experiments with directional antennas or high gain antennas. It turns out it's actually, if you do the, the simple thing, it doesn't work very well. You want to use the same kind of antenna for training as you use for tracking. Otherwise, uh, the, 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 the mismatch in the antenna characteristics can... Then you, then you must have ground truth then to augment that. Right. What do you mean by ground truth? Uh, to know actually where the beacon physically is. No. So what you can do is do essentially if you have enough uh, positions where you hear the beacon from, you can do a triangulation based on that. So if you drive around the entire block and the beacon happens to be in the middle of the block, then uh, once you have gathered all the data for around the block, you can uh, employ triangulation techniques after that. Just talk more about. Thank you. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this. Yeah. 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 Oh, and. We're going to be here, so we're happy to take all the questions and more afterwards as well. Um, so this is a little more detail about where these things coming from. So I mentioned explicit mapping. The company school service providers and things, they often know where they're, they are. I know, I know Intel IT has a good idea on the map of where all the APs are at the facilities, and I, I have to believe that, that Microsoft IT is, is, is similar or can, can get the information through some sort of coding. So I mentioned this war driving. The basic war driving setup is a laptop, GPS, and some free software. There's NetStumble or a bunch of other ones out there that generate these logs and we can take use of that. And then there's this, this community that's built up, the, these web portals that know how to collect these logs. For example, Wiggle.net has over 2 million APs mapped around the world. And PlaceLab, you know, if, you, if you're a Wiggle user, you can just put in your credentials and we can pull down all those 2 million and suddenly you have coverage for quite a bit of the world. Now there's issues with the data being out of date and stale and so forth and that's where the, some of the self-mapping feedback stuff comes in to deal with that. However, the answer is yes, your AP probably is in that database. Yes. <laughs> if, you, if you're wondering, you, you can actually, they, Wiggle has an interface, you can go out and put in your address or your SSID and it's likely that it's in there. It's pretty complete for a lot of the major metro areas in the world. Got a couple more questions. Here. How robust are you against some uh, few pieces of bad information? The ARPANET have been brought down by one node telling lies about its location. There's certainly we believe we can handle the cases where the natural evolution of things. We haven't strove to to 
particularly deal with people who are trying to be absolutely malicious. Although when we talk about the peer-to-peer -peer stuff... People were in lines, and Dode was lying. Right. So flip the sign of a bit, and then that went crashing. There's actually a better story than that. We're, we can deal with egregious errors. Oh. We can't handle errors where someone moves the access point by 100 meters. Oh, I see. Sorry. So, so if someone says you know, the access point is in Seattle, but the access point is reporting it's in New York, that's easy to detect. Very, very oh, that's easy. very easy to detect. Okay. Yeah, stuff like that, the stuff, and, even, and whether they're doing it intentionally or whether because you know they graduated from UW and they picked up their little <laughs> access point out of their fraternity house and they moved back to New York and they put it there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, we can detect and evolve those type of things, absolutely. So um, you said up front that accuracy was not necessarily what was driving this work. But one of the things you mentioned is that in the uh, you know downtown New York, for example, the urban canyons, uh, GPS doesn't work. At this, by the sort of the same token, the beacons are going to bounce off of all over the place. And exactly. What is the You'll see what that. is the accuracy there? See. We've studied accuracy fairly extensively, even though that's not what we're focusing on. It is a very important axis of analysis, and so we've studied it. Um, and we'll have we have graphs and numbers and stuff. And so if I don't answer your question, let, make sure to bring it up again. But I, I imagine I will. We have data for exactly this. Yes. And right. Downtown Urban Canyon is less accurate than yuppie one-story neighborhood, actually, because of exactly that effect. Yep. Yep. So, and then there's self-mapping, which I've mentioned a number of times, which I'll get back to. Um, so just the, the, these are some back of the envelope calculations. People often ask this about, you know, how big is this database of access points? Now, we made a number of assumptions here, so take these figures what you will. But the bottom line is these access points really fit on the devices in question, we believe. You know, we're, we're making some assumptions about the rate, you know, the ratio of APs to people of the, of the various types here. But the bottom line is if the world really fit, do, does fit in 2.5 gigs, you know, the entire database that is actually reasonable to store on a device. We're not talking about you don't need a, you don't need a array to array on your notebook to store this stuff. Um, just a, a little bit of, uh, you know, boilerplate status here. Um, the, the system was built in J, uh, J2ME, so we actually went for sort of a minimalistic thing so we can run it across multiple devices. And as you see, it, it runs on full-fledged notebooks as well as it runs on um, handhelds, and now it actually runs the 2.0 release. We actually run on the, anything that's a Symbian OS, you know, Series 60 uh, type cell phone like the one I have sitting right here. So Nokia makes a lot of them, uh, a lot of those. Um, yeah, and it, it is actually, the software has been released open source. You can get it. There's a good startup guides and everything. You just go to placelab.org and download it, and it, it works. Um, so let's move into the next section. Let's, get, let's see, start to see some more technical results here. This is some of these analysis we did on accuracy, coverage, and density. So the first thing, coverage. We've been saying, you know, GPS has low coverage, but, you know, let's prove it. Um, so we did an experiment where, in this case, we gave three users during 10 random waking hours of their life, we gave them a Wi-Fi PDA thing, a GPS unit, and a GSM phone, and these were all actually linked together to, do, to be able to log what they were seeing and log how often they were seeing it. And then we just said, you know, we let these people go about their lives and we said, you know, how often can you actually see these different technologies? And it turns out that as we thought, GPS is actually very low. I mean, even our retail clerk here who commuted to work and everything, she happened to have the device in her backpack and then she got on a bus and couldn't see GPS in the bus and then you know got off the bus and it was still in her backpack went to work was inside all day came home and she never saw GPS uh, uh, once the whole day basically or she saw it a couple of brief times at basically round to zero but you know enough to uh, get give a, a big gap and the other thing to notice about GPS is that the gap size is very big Whereas something like uh, 80211 or GSM has very, very high coverage because of course, if you're T-Mobile, if you decide to provide service in an area, you're going to strive for 100% coverage because that's your business. So what's the implication for this? Well, here's, here's a, here's a more, much more detailed slide. This is where we analyze accuracy and coverage. So what we did for this experiment is we went to three different places. We went to downtown Seattle, went to Ravenna, which is kind of one of these urban residential areas, and then we went way out to suburban Kirkland where it's, you know, big lots and trees and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, some of you may live there. Um, <laughs> and uh, then we, we, the experiment with, that we did here is we either drove or walked around with a, a um, I guess, yeah, I guess this experiment was all driving. We, we went around with the GPS unit and 
uh, logging all the beacons that we were seeing. And we, then we broke the log into two sets. We broke the log into a 30-minute set around the place that we used to, to infer where the beacons were, and then a 30-minute test trace that was separate th that we used to determine the accuracy of it. Uh, we sampled 802.11 at 4 hertz and GSM at 1 hertz. And all of these numbers we used the GPS as ground truth. So these numbers are bounded by the accuracy of GPS, which is about 5 to 10 meters, depending on practically about 8 to 10 meters, depending on how, how, uh, how certain you are. So there's a number of interesting things to notice on this slide. One thing is that 802.11 does pretty well. However, out here in Kirkland, you'll notice you, you only see 802.11 about 42% of the time, which is not surprising. You know, somebody might have an access point in their house, and there's, there's gaps, there's big lots, there's trees, there's things that, that influence that. GSM coverage was very high throughout. And um, the combination, if you, if you take these and you do a, a fusion algorithm and you combine them, the combination, you end up with 100% coverage. Now, the interesting thing to notice here is that although the accuracy of GSM is very high, when you combine the two, the accuracy from this, you actually don't lose much accuracy here. And the, the intuition behind that is because the, uh, the gap size is very small. So that uh, 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 any reasonable algorithm, like a Bayes filter, can be able to fill in the gaps with a reasonable motion model and still be able to estimate this with fairly good accuracy. So you end up with, by fusing, you end up with 100% coverage with accuracy that's not much worse than 802.11. Alone, Anthony wants to add something. Oh, so I just wanted to define really clearly what coverage was. In this case, 42% means 42% of the scans saw an access point. And the scans are happening four times a second. So you know, any sensible you know bit of middleware that doesn't see something for a second or two can still say, well, he probably hasn't gone far. Let's just leave him there. So this really is an absolute sort of worst case coverage. Yeah, this isn't. Yeah, yeah. Any and the the, the coverage. Yeah, I I forgot to mention that is definitely just. How, what percentage of the time did you see the access point? And, and yeah, even the basic kind of predict, you know, sliding window algorithm can, will, will do better than that coverage, but yeah. So one of the things I wanted to mention in response to Jitu's question earlier is, so the, the reason downtown is bad is not just because of all the uh, multipath effects that you have. It's also a lot of the access points end up being higher up uh, in the tall buildings, mm -hmm. and so they end up having a much wider range. So we did, did analysis of how far out you see an access point. And in Ravenna and Kirkland, the numbers are fairly similar. In fact, Ravenna, you, you see the shortest range because it's still a dense neighborhood. And downtown actually ends up being closer to Kirkland because the APs end up being higher up. So you see them much, much further out. And that uh, affects your accuracy. It's actually worth saying that the opposite happens with GSM. The reason that downtown has more accurate GSM is because the towers by, for reasons of capacity, have actually been, the, the cells have actually been shrunk because they actually need more cells because there are more people with cell phones. And of course, a lot of places in Europe, that would get even better with GSM. Where even told where that, yeah. There's micro cells and there's a, a little bit different GSM deployment in there. Yeah. yeah. You should probably caveat that uh, if you were to drive to Roslyn and Clay Ellen, you wouldn't get the same kind of coverage. That's true. That, that is true. But you get better GPS. But GPS was You get better GPS, so that, that, that's exactly, yeah. They're, they're saying exactly what I would say, and we do. Yes, we have this notion, which we're actually not talking about here, but we have this notion we call always best location, or ABL, which is basically, you know, any, a good sens sensible fusion algorithm will take, uh, will take all the technologies and just basically be able to infer the best from everything. And that's, that's actually the default. If you just run Place Lab, that's what you, that's what you get. We have another. For your GSM coverage, um, does it mean that you think you have a GSM tower they can use, or does it mean that you have enough to get your location? It means you can see a GSM tower. Whether you can make a phone call is a different issue. Show yeah. the forward of the demo card. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, for example, it's running right now, and here's what you can see. So we got a number of access points, and we actually have it so that uh, of course, my notebook is, doesn't have a GSM phone built into it. This is not some you know, new high-tech Intel prototype that has a GSM phone built into it. It's actually linked in an ensemble with my, with my cell phone. And it works both ways. The cell phone can link to the notebook also and use the Wi-Fi. And so we just have a, you know, they share the information. So you notice, you know, not surprisingly, in a big campus like this, we see a lot of you know, MSR, Microsoft Wireless LAN. You take this a lot of places, you see, you know, 
80% of the access points are named Linksys, default, uh, home, or some, you know, something else. It's, 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 re it's really addicting to just watch and look at the access points as you, as you see. Get off my network. You, know, you get SSIDs like that. But again, we're not using the SSID. We're using the, the MAC address as the unique identifier. So a question. It is using Bluetooth also, absolutely. In fact, we're scanning for Bluetooth right now. We have a, a little bit to say about Bluetooth at the end. And is it talking from the laptop to the phone via Bluetooth, or is that? It's talking from the laptop to the phone via Bluetooth, and it's also scanning for, for Bluetooth devices Fixed in the environment. Bluetooth Fixed Bluetooth devices, yeah. So it, it's down to about a meter precision, you know, where that's not changing. Are you using any of John's calibration in these local Wi-Fi, or is it right out of the public domain? This, this, is, this is out of... Well, so this is actually, we, we showed up about five minutes for the talk, walked around the campus, ran it through our mapping algorithms, and added them to the database. Um, this is obviously a technique that does some sort of, some sort of calibration or fingerprinting, is going to get, be able to get much, much better accuracy. But of course, it's the well-known trade-off between you know, fingerprinting overhead, and this is just all geometric based on, you know, we inferred estimated positions of the access points and then estimated positions based on the estimated positions of the access points. So it's all just geometric. So how long did it take you to calibrate? We literally walked around 1.13. Yeah, we showed up, you know, about 10 o'clock and just sort of walked around 1.12, 1.13 and, and ran it through the, the estimation algorithms. And Algorithmically, this, what we're doing here is pretty unsophisticated. Yeah, and the right use the GPS to, to get the original. Exactly. Yep. And the right solution is to actually use something like John's so you actually say, Gee, you know, I'm seeing these beacons. What's the best I can do? If well, you, oh, we if have you location. Sub meter. I mean, if that's you know, that's it's to not, a meter. That's 20, 25 meter. That's oh. I mean, yeah. The degrees of precision. Those numbers of digits have nothing to do. With yeah, the, the calibration stuff that John has done those numbers provides you much, much more it's accuracy. Digits are staying the it's same. A, it's a different trade-off in the space. It's right. I mean, if it's seen the same four APs, it might pick the same place over and over again, but it'd still be wrong. Um. So, dot dot. Question here. On your on your previous slide, you mentioned that you basically had no GPS coverage, like in downtown, for example. Uh, I won't say no, but you have you have low because of the big, you know. So, so how did that actually affect your your data you're collecting here with using GPS as ground truth when you're when you're downtown? So in that case, we were we were very careful to have GPS. Stick to the middle lane. Yeah, stick to the middle lane. You know. I'm just wondering if you're pulling that, you know, pulling that with that frequency, and you don't have GPS at the time, how that actually affects. So th these numbers, we actually filtered out all the ones that aren't correlated. With GPS, we we sort of did the right thing with these numbers. They, oh, we didn't see it. Well, we're not gonna. We're just gonna ignore those. We're not gonna make our numbers look better. But so uh, look, we can dive in and show a little more detail here on the on the coverage of 802.11 for the for the some of the more networking heads in the audience. Um, this is the you know the, those are cute little satellite photos of the overheads of the, the roughly the areas we went. But this gives a breakdown a little bit more of the density. Now this is when you scan in each of these places how many access points you see. So downtown, you notice there was never a point where we didn't see an access point downtown. It happened occasionally here in Ravenna, but you notice these curves actually looked very similar. And out in Kirkland, as you'd expect, there's a lot of, of scans where you saw uh, no access points, and then it, it kind of tapers off from there. So this sort of gives a good characterization of these, these at least these three particular environments. Um, so one interesting thing you can do is, you know, sort of a basic algorithm. You just take these access points that you see, and you, you, you a question before we move on. Yes, the, the graph downtown doesn't look like a random process. There are really no zeros, and at this expectation, there should have been some zeros. So what's happening? Is there really a dense grid of access points with the market supply? It's real. I mean, this is the data. We we, we went downtown and did. But as you see, it does not look like a, does not look like a Poisson process. A Poisson would have had, I don't know, three four percent of uh, zeros. Yeah, we haven't explored really the theory of trying to fit these to curves and, and, and explain the explain the process that much. But yeah, I mean, this was just front. This is the histogram of the data. We didn't. I mean, we never took a scan, and really we didn't see an access point. Right? Downtown is really black and white. Right. Yeah. yeah. There are APs on high 20th floors that you can hear, you know, a dozen blocks in each direction. Yeah, but, the, but, the, but then the, the, the distribution should drift further to the right. If they were just blank and not random, you know, you'd run off to the right. Yeah. I don't know. This has to do with the channel interference, too. There are actually, ah, there's, you can okay. stand sorry, in one channel place. interference is stopping you seeing 17 points. If you, yeah. over a long period of time, you can see 30, but you never see more than like 11 in one scan. Yeah, there's a number of factors. Channel interference is ah. becoming more and more of an issue sorry. with right. 802 where it's actually regulated in some countries now. Because we're doing a scan every 250 milliseconds, we can't spend that much time on the channel. So you, you, you're not going to hear the far away AP that, that awesome. 
Right. So, you know, the basic thing you can do is, you know, you can just use some combination of the ones you see. So we've investigated a number of things in the algorithms work to make this better. For example, we've looked at signal strength. And we've looked at a lot of people would say, let's use signal strength for, for correlating distance. Um, signal strength is a fairly marginal indicator of distance. It works. It adds a little bit. It adds, you know, 4 or 5% to the accuracy if you include signal strength information in that correlation. Um, another metric you can use that um, we found works very well, which kind of exploits the second order effects of some of this channel interference, the way the MAC protocols work, is a response rate, which is basically 1 minus the loss rate of the beacon frames. Where you, you say, you notice in that when I was running this, that uh, the AP viewer, the showing the access points, there's certain ones, if you're standing right next to the access point, you're going to see that access point in every scan. But as you get farther away from the access points, a number of factors come together where you might see it every fourth scan. And you can turn, in the aggregate, you can sort of exploit this effect. And it actually turns out to pre, be a fairly decent correlator, or fairly, fairly correlates fairly well with distance. Um, and uh, that, it's kind of interesting. We're still sort of exploring exactly what the implication for this is and trying to characterize it a little bit better. Um, we had a question over here about Bluetooth. Well, the result, one of the bottom lines about Bluetooth that came out of this is Bluetooth is much less useful than 802.11 and GSM. There's very, very few fixed Bluetooth in the devices in the environment. And just to be clear, we're not, we, we filter out things like, you know, all the people's cell phones and stuff like that that are mobile devices. We're talking about printers, parking meters, uh, vending machines, stuff like that. There's very few of them in the environment. The other thing about Bluetooth we found is that the range is sort of deceptively large. Although the communication range is about 30 feet or so, um, you can actually hear, you can actually scan and see things much, much, much longer than that, more like 30 meters or so. For example, in our lab space, which is about 30 meters square on the side, we can see all the Bluetooth things in the lab from any point in the lab. So. Um, the other thing about Bluetooth is the, because of the way the protocol works, the scan time is 10 seconds. So instead of operating at 4 hertz, we're operating at 0.1 hertz, which you, know, you, can, get, you, know, you can scan 40 times more, more 802.11. So even though 802.11 has a slightly longer range and bigger cells, it turns out to be much better to use 802.11 because you get 40 times as much data. We did a little experiment in our lab where we deployed a bunch of Bluetooth beacons to try to see how, what kind of accuracy we could get in, an, in a well-known deployment. And we got about 10 meter accuracy, which is a little bit better, but that was it, really not worth it. Question? Was there? Oh, OK. That was out in the hall. All right. Um, so now we're gonna, I'm going to talk about in a little bit less detail some of these, uh, some, some uh, other research that we've done with this. We've done a lot of work on this project. So the first thing is this uh, Wi-Fi bake-off, comparing me metro scale location algorithms. And this is something that we actually did in collaboration with John. Um, so we, we looked at three particular algorithms. We looked at a basic centroid, which just takes the ar arithmetic mean of the, the, the beacons that you hear. Fingerprinting, which is the, the classic technique that radar and other things use, where you use the signal strength signature of the access points. You say, I'm going to stand here, I'm going to collect a signal strength signature, and then when I see that signature again, I know I'm here again. This stems from the observation that things tend to be fairly stable when you're at one point. Now, I can turn this way, and it can be very different because of the effect of the big bag of water. But um, things tend to be fairly stable at one, at one point. And we compared two different algorithms, the, the radar using a, a distance search, and then the rank stuff that, was, that John has uh, published on about you doing the comparative the relative rank of signals. And then finally, we, we used, uh, compared against a, sort of a base filter uh, approximation. And we looked at these, in the, in the, again, on traces from the same three environments. And um, they're, they're actually uh, fairly similar. To, uh, to one another. Now, the, the, the analysis actually comes in. Let's get to the next slide here. Uh, where we varied things like the age of the training data, how much noise was in the GPS, and how much, what the density of the training data we actually had in the testing. So it turns out if you vary the age of the training data, you know, even if you have uh, old data where you, know, you actually only about 50% of the APs are there, um, it doesn't degrade the accuracy all that much. And, um, if you want some more details, you can, you, I, I, let's uh, talk a, a little later on that. Um, how about noise in the GPS data? Well, it has minimal effect on the centroid and the particle filter stuff because they're sort of expecting this, this noise in the, in the 
that the access points have estimated positions anyway. But as you can imagine, and, and logically, the fingerprinting does much worse because it's depending on having this idea of where the fingerprint is and taking the ground truth for that position. So it actually degrades that much more. And then finally, on the density of the training data, data until, until you drop the, uh, the density below this 10 meter average distance between points, it doesn't, it doesn't have that much of an effect. Um, Yatin can tell you more about this, this, part, this part later. And um, yeah. So another cl different class of applications that we've done for you know, a different segment of the audience is investigating uh, in the application space this, this class of application we call social mobile applications. And there's a lot of applications that exist in this space. For example, AT&T has Friend Finder where you can find the distance to all your nearest friends. There's this growing popularity dodgeball service where you know you say, it's just, that's just SMS text-based, but it basically you say, I'm in this bar, and you can find out other people who may be in this bar, things around you. It started in New York, and it's sort of been growing in, growing in popularity. There's location-enhanced IM like this, where you can do things like basic things like set your status message or your availability based on where you are. And then there's Reno, which is our, our project, where we use the cell phone platform to do sort of lightweight location sharing. You know, tell so-and-so that I'm now at the bus stop. Tell them that I'm at work. You know, where are, you know, ask somebody where they are and stuff like that. We're sort of lightweight location sharing. So um, we've, done, we've implemented this, this system called Reno. Um, it allows you to query where someone else is. It allows you to tell someone else where you are. Um, there's a, also included a number of automatic features to automatically tell someone when you get to a place. You can set up a, a, an automatic send. You can set up an automatic reply. You can say, if someone asks me where I am, just you know, tell, them, tell them the name of the place that I'm at. Um, you can do things like logging. You can uh, record new places in the phone. This is just uses the GSM cell towers to do this. So this is just the system we implemented. And then the, the research is actually the studies that we've done of this application in, uh, in use. So we've done three studies. Two of them have, have been uh, published, and the third one is about to be. The third one's uh, in progress right now. Um, so first, we, we looked at the question of what and when do people, when do we disclose location? Just in general, what do, what do we care about? So we did an ESM study, which is a study, it's called experience sampling. It's kind of in situ. You prompt someone on a device in real time, the device beeps, and they, they answer a question. Um, we did 16 participants for two weeks. And um, our theory going into this was that people would say, People would want to say, well, you know, for my privacy, I'm just going to tell somebody I'm in Seattle instead of I'm at, you know, the corner of Fifth and Main and the McDonald's or something. Um, but it turns out that, that that actually wasn't the case, that uh, people actually didn't blur like that. People made a, a binary decision where they said, I'm either not going to tell someone, I'm either going to tell them the system is busy, you know, just fake them out, or I'm going to tell them the most accurate thing I can that I think will help them know exactly what they need to know. Uh, we should point out that we actually got their social network and customized the device. So it actually said, you know, yeah. Doug Terry wants to know where you are right now, or your wife wants to know where you are right now. So we actually broke down by what, you know, by, by the social relationship. And yeah, this was a fairly extensive study. With, uh, I'm not surprised people share with the boss least of all, the spouse most of all. But what's interesting was the blurring didn't occur. The blurring didn't occur, which is what our intuition was that it was. The second study we did was, what are some of Reno's uses? I mean, how, how do people actually use this? Um, the, 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 the thing that came out of this was a pilot study with mostly internal participants and then some of our, as in lab participants, and some of our social network. And the, the most interesting thing that came out of this is that the place you are really signifies the context you're in. I mean, if I'm at 1100 Northeast 45th, I'm at work. And people know that I'm at work. Or I, perhaps I'm on the first floor eating at Quiznos. But. And then the last study is, how is this used really? And this is where we, we dropped the internal participants and we went to an external group with 11 users. And this was actually uh, high school students and their, their parents and other, other students that are in their social networks. We actually gave phones to these people and let them use it for two weeks and did you know, rounds of interviews. And we logged all the data and the, the information they passed back and forth. And there's a couple of things that came out of this. One is that, at least in this case that we were looking at, the automatic functions really didn't turn out to be that necessary. P 
people particularly wanted the, the manual things. And even in the case where the social networks got very big, and you figure, you know, you know, if I have 26 friends or I have eight friends and I want to be able to share my location, I might want some automatic features. That turned out to be not so much the case because people who have that many friends are willing to put in the effort to deal with having that many friends. And they, they, that was much, much more preferred. People wanted, for example, some feature things like they wanted it to be integrated with text messaging much closer than the way it was. And an, uh, an interesting sort of meta conclusion is that, not surprisingly, people are perhaps more interested in sharing not really where they are, but what they're doing. And where they are is an important place of that. So how does that tie to your observation of the second that the place context? Well, th th this one said that the, the people would share the place they thought would reveal the most context about them, about what they were doing. And then this, this conclusion actually sort of solidifies that. Um, that, that people really want to be sharing what they're doing in a way that is most useful for the other people. So they don't want to know you're at work or what you're doing at work? They, it, dep it, it depends on who you're sharing that with. Okay. I mean, some people would, would want to just know you're at work or when you're about to leave or something like that. We saw really extreme cases of people taking location and extrapolating it really far out. And there was a case where in the, in the pilot study, a system told someone's wife that they were at Trader Joe's, and the wife chose not to go out and get dessert because it was 5 o'clock, and he was probably on the way home, and he was going to pick up my favorite dessert at Trader Joe's. And of course, he did it. He was actually at the bus stop, which was in the same cell tower, and she was actually not happy. <laughs> but I mean, these kinds of things are really personal experiences. Uh, yeah, people do start to infer an awful lot from this when you share stuff. Okay. Another question. It may be my bias, but I, I would say that the high order information as to what the user is doing is a velocity, velocity relative to the ground. If somebody is doing 60 MPH, there's no time to fall. Well, if you, for interruptibility, yes, that, that, that may be the case. Um, these, this really gets into issues of, of, of name. And we weren't sharing coordinates and velocities here. We were sharing names. And moreover, we were sharing names that people self-assigned. To these places. So I can go to 1100 Northeast 45th and I can say this is, you know, Bob's tanning salon. And, and if that's something, even if it's not, and I, I know if I agree with the people around me that that's what it is, or I can call it, you know, my happy place or something like that. And it, as long as I, people, it's all, it's all about the context. So th there is some complexity there. But for interruptibility, I think you might be right. What about supporting that, that motion concept, right? So rather than being at the bus stop along I-90, I'm actually driving down I-90. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, um... But that's just one piece of content. Yeah, that... No, that's hugely important. And that's actually really... It's one of the things the system predicts in addition to location, is also predict velocity and heading. And absolutely, moving at 60 miles an hour is a really important yeah. piece of your context. Yeah, yeah. It depends on what, again, it depends on what you're trying to do with it, but yes. When you turn a uh, coordinate to a name and give it to outsiders, you really want to watch out for errors. And, you know, five places share the same error. Right, error. And, and, and we're actually going to be looking at that. In fact, this, the underlying technology for Reno, used a, a cell fingerprint stuff that had been published before. This actually didn't go through geocoordinates. It just took a fingerprint of the cell towers in the area and looked for that fingerprint again. Because people would only end up assigning, you know, five to thirty places, and so that's that's more with it, well within the range of, of fingerprinting. So we're looking at that some more, as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So switching to the other end of the spectrum, switching to some system stuff now. We've done, we did some work, and we, I mean, Yachten in particular, uh, led this work. Um, so you want to talk to him for the, the nitty gritty about this. Um, so work with a peer-to-peer -peer Deacon database, taking this Beacon database and distributing it out in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. Well, why would you want to do that? Well, one, control. You can avoid having a, a central authority that manages the database. Second, for uh, privacy and trust. And there's a lot of people who might have stake of privacy and trust. There's the people who own the access points, the people who are using PlaceLab to do the positioning, and potentially the, the people, the ISPs, the people providing the network. Um, connectivity and so forth. Um, so we investigated a number of things, like the ways you could take these, these uh, trace logs and split them out to different nodes across APs. And in particular, we uh, 
used um, distributed hash tables to route the, the things to the appropriate points and to get the data to the right points. Um, so there's, there's three uh, big challenges. One is that I, what I just mentioned there. The other one is this idea of how to filter out bad data. And we use a technique there we called, uh, we've been calling it neighborhood clustering, which is basically you take a local area fingerprint of the APs that are often seen with this other one. And it allows you to detect some of the stuff that's been brought up about when, when nodes move or when there's egregious errors. That's the method behind that. You kind of augment this geometric stuff with a, with a local area neighborhood fingerprint that allows you to statistically detect when something may have moved a significant amount or an anomaly may have occurred. Um, and then another innovation that, we've, that we had here is, uh, that came out of this work is um, on retrieving location maps then on getting this information out of the, out of the uh, DHT to do uh, 2D range queries over uh, 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 prefix hash trees. So that's a, their 1D had been done in the past and we extended it to 2D. So, and you can talk to Yotten uh, about more details about that. Um, let's see. I have two small things that we're doing. This is ongoing and, uh, ongoing and or future work here. Talk a little bit about the self-mapping. We mentioned a number of times we have some preliminary results there of how well this works. And then some of the issues of going, uh, this intersection between uh, location as in coordinates and place and how you, how you deal with those things. Um, so self-mapping, this is again the idea that you can use, PlaceLab without GPS can potentially be used to feed back and gradually evolve the positions of the beacons itself and just create this feedback loop. Um, so clients can basically be mapping all the time. I mean, to think of it from a user scenario, you have a device with GPS on it and this device is also watching beacons. And so from the user's perspective, it basically seems to be that their GPS sort of gradually starts to work indoors as it learns the beacons. And I mean, this is, this is a potentially a very appealing model. Um, so there's a small amount of initial ground truth data needed. Now this could be provided by you know, something you map explicitly, something you get from, say, all the T-Mobile the, the hotspots that may know where they are. But we, here's some preliminary results on this of showing how the median accuracy degrades as you um, remove the, the, amount of, the number of beacons that are initially known in the database. So with all of them, this is the result you've seen before, we can get about 15 meter accuracy. If you throw away half of the beacons in the database, and then, so you get rid of half the beacons in the database, and then you run and you self-map those 50% those back in again, and then you run the test trace on it, it degrades the accuracy to 19, and you can see the rest of how it degrades. Now you might ask, well, so how is this number different than if I just used only 50% and didn't do self-mapping? Well, it turns out that that's a little worse. You may get like 21 meter accuracy or so if you just use only 50% of them to locate. But the disadvantage there is you've lost a lot in coverage. Whereas doing self-mapping and doing this feedback, you maintain the same amount of coverage that you had with all the APs, but you only actually had to have half of them or a quarter of them to map. So this is, we, there, there's a lot more work going on that we're doing in this area. For example, we're also looking at how can you do this across technology. So if you know GSM towers, can you use the GSM to war drive the, uh, the 802.11 access points, for example, <laughs> and, and build one off the other. But this is still work in progress. Would there be a legal ramification regarding using someone else's access point without their implicit, like, explicit consent? Well, using, yes. Uh, listening for listening. From what we've been told, no. From what we've been told, you know, if, if we're just listening to the, the, the uh, BSS ID that someone is broadcasting out, that there is not legal ramifications for doing that. Now, is there for, if we were to, if, we're, if Intel were to go into the business of building this big database of people's APs and sharing it with the whole world who wants it and, you know, potentially using it for war drivers, sure, there might be legal ramifications for that. But, Isn't that what we did? But, um, no, we didn't do it. The, the community did it. And, and just it. It's all gray areas, and we, we have talked with uh, Intel Legal about this, and we've, we've been very cognizant of this, yes. In the U.S., by the <coughs> of radar detector, you seem to be a very secure ground. Other countries may be different. There are right. where every radio receiver needs licensing. Yeah. The U.S., except for two states, the police have more cloud than most people. They can't stop you with a radar detector. Nobody else can. Right. And there, there's, there is potential 
things to watch out for in this. There's also issues with the, the privacy of the data and so forth. And we are actually have been looking at some of these things. And, and I, I'm happy to talk more about this off after, afterwards here. Um, almost wrapped up here. Here's a, here's a quick example of this. I have this slide and then one more on location to place and then I'll conclude. Um, this is an example of, this is one that's mapped with War Drive. This shows, uh, based on uh, the, the places that you saw the access point, this shows the red is the places that you, where you were and you didn't see this access point, going up from yellow to green to where you saw it with a different quality. And you can see as you, uh, as you throw away more and more of the data and you don't use GPS more and more as you get to this side where you end up throwing away all but 10% of the access points, your certainty about where the access point might be, we can still place it fairly well except that the, the certainty is much lower as to where the access point actually actually is over there. Um, and uh, I would say talk to uh, Anthony a little bit more about these particular graphs afterwards if, you, if you're interested. And then the last thing is the observation that people describe places with names and not coordinates. We've seen a little bit this in the, in the Reno, at least for certain classes of applications. <coughs> so we're studying the types of places people go and trying to improve methods for uh, learning those places and detecting when they return to significant waypoints. So we're in, in process with a two-phase study right now where we're doing a, a user study to collect the types of places people talk about and understand the separation of those places and, and the names of them and how they refer to them and how they respond to errors in, in that. And then we're also, um, if you see, we have a, a number of uh, hot bags we carry around with us. We're also gathering 24-7 logs of of all these, uh, the sensor information as we go around to, to compare the uh, learning and, and resolving algorithms on, on actual data from, from, well, as real of people as we are uh, right now, <laughs> which, you know, judge that for yourself. So to conclude, um, we're operating from this hypothesis that high coverage has value even at the, even at the expense of, of a little bit of accuracy, as long as you understand the accuracy. Um, and the approach, again, is uh, beacon-based location with uh, uh, GSM, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth right now, potentially expanded to other things, as well as GPS and the whole always best location story fits in there. And the result we've seen is depending on the technologies you have available, you can get 5 to 150 meter accuracy in the cities with uh, nearly 100% coverage of, of uh, users' days. And we've uh, made a number of contributions here, and I'm happy to take some questions, and we'll be around if uh, you have detailed questions for any of us. Thank you. <laughs> it's always questionings throughout, so if there's no more, I'm, I'm, I'm just fine with that. John? Are you worried about WiMAX? Does WiMAX help you? Or well, you? WiMAX, WiMAX, WiMAX is very interesting. WiMAX is, well, why, in some ways, WiMAX particularly looks like GSM. It's, it's the, the, the WiMAX story is, you know, the big, the big tower that then kind of is the second to last hop that then you know serves serves local things. It it has a range that's kind of similar to a big GSM tower. So um, I don't think it would hurt. It would certainly do more to enhance the coverage if WiMAX were were deployed. Um, technology give it and take it away, right? Something with a really huge range gives you great coverage, like GSM. Something that's really really tiny, ultra wide, and it's three feet. It's fabulous because if you see it, you know you're at your desk. So I'd say WiMAX is a great fill at the end of the of the cover. Oh, I, I, I would say it's not even at the end. I mean, the the end, or I mean, this might not be at the end, but you know, there's the the I guess it's right. the right spot stuff where you're talking about using you know FM towers and talking about you know 20 mile accuracy or something right like that. Digital TV I mean, 200 miles. What? Digital TV 200. Miles. 200 miles of digital TV, and who knows? Maybe there's like continental satellites that broadcast unique IDs, so you know if you're in North America. I mean, this thing kind of scales different directions. We've been focusing sort of on this end of of what are the technologies that are actually out there that are in the you know give you the tens of meters, tens to hundreds of meters accuracy. Um, I'm quite naive about the 802.11. Is there any differences in the various flavors, A, B, G, and um, I, mean, I, I just put in an N, and I mean the, the coverage jumps up a lot. The, but like, what do you what what do you get, and what gets taken away in those different flavors? So there, from this perspective, there's 
The ranges can be a little different, although some of that range is just the range at which you can maintain certain throughputs. Now, N in particular, I've messed around with one of those, those pre-N things, and it, it does have a much longer range. We, we haven't really investigated that a lot because it's not out there yet. I mean, I just have one sitting on my desk. But um, certainly with ABG, it's really all the same from this perspective of collecting beacon IDs. I mean, the, the, dif the differentiators there is in the, the, the data rates and the, the, the security protocols, perhaps, that they can support, like 802.1x stuff. So the, Probably that's the somewhat. Is all the same. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> I just noticed, I can, see, I can see many more of my neighbors now that I couldn't see before. With, with the N? The N, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, N introduced some new things, and I, I'm honestly not technically savvy enough on it yet to, uh, I haven't read the spec on N yet, so I don't know exactly what's different about it if they're doing some stuff with antennas and stuff. It's just, I have to confess my own ignorance on that. I haven't kept up with the, that protocol yet, but so I'm not sure I can totally answer your question. Very, very high level question. Mm -hmm. um, when you brought up this example of work in prison, I was, I was wondering about the vertical dimension. And uh, so it looks like there a lot of people look at you know where you are in, in terms of 2D space. But I think I've got two questions. A, let's if we just assume that we had the vertical dimension, what would that buy you? Would you, I mean, you said what people really care about is where you are, what you do. Um, would that be helpful to know with what floor you're on or other even? And then the next question is, let's assume we find something useful in there. For example, if I'm in the metro, in a subway or something, and I'm not referring to quiz now. Um, then, um, how would we find out about that? What, do we do things like what people do with like air pressure raise things, or what are, what are ways of tracking? No, the so the, there's a no, there's things. Why would you map it to other even maps of like you obviously have maps where it's things in 2D are what building, but are there any maps available where people know how high buildings are, how many floors, what's in the individual floors? So there are maps available. There aren't many maps available. All this stuff just you know basically assumes that the Earth is flat um, for the most part. Although the, the coordinates are modeled in proper you know proper Earth coordinates, but. Um, We've been calling this uh, 2 and a half D, 2.5 D. Um, the general approach that we've taken, and this we've been actually working with, uh, uh, working along with a couple of uh, UW students on this, is um, to mo because the, the places where you tend to care about those things, at least at, at first order, are are buildings that actually have multiple stories. So we've been looking at this hybrid <laughs> approach of combining this geometric stuff with a a rough fingerprinting based thing that just basically is to differentiate which floor you're on. Um, now we have another project that talks about uh, you know using uh, a digital um, barometer to do this. Um, but that, at least right now, part of the Place Lab story that might have been implicit, I didn't say it explicitly, is that uh, all this stuff works on commodity hardware. You know, you can take your phone and your Notebook, and you can go get this, and it will work. And so, that sort of, you know, pushes against the pushes against the Play-Doh a little bit, and um, in a way that we haven't. Yeah. So, we, so if you're asking if we think about it, absolutely, and we came to the conclusion that actual 3D is not important. Knowing you're 14 and a half meters above sea level is totally useless because that could be laptop on a table, or it could be on the floor on the second floor. So we're actually shooting for two and a half D, which is a symbolic name. You're on the third floor mezzanine. And we think we can do that by just annotating the beacons with what floor they're on and running, running up at that base. Like we see, haven't finished it yet. I could see in some cases even just knowing that you stopped somewhere and then went 12, 12 yards up might be interesting, right? There's probably a park the car into yep. an elevator or something. So just looking at that data might allow you to. Yeah, there are behavioral issues. And we, another thing is we sort of didn't you know, charge headstrong into this, let's get 2.5D working until we really looked some more at some of this. The, like the social mobile stuff and really understand how important is floor compared to other things and you know we could go off and try to solve this two and a half D problem but it's really tied up with how people name and share places and how people want to reason about places so um, we didn't dive too headstrong into it yet but we've absolutely thought about it and, and have worked with a number of people. I'm actually interested in two and a half maybe actually just just half D. What to say you know we're driving hard but what if 
you know, in, in some application domains, like let's imagine, you know, a hotel manager, he wants to know where the, you know, where the maintenance people are. Floor might actually be the single most important thing, which is, and in terms of mapping, that's actually quite easy. You take your device and you say, I'm on one, and then you run around one. You say, I'm on two, run around two. I'm on three. I don't know exactly where I am on the floor, but just saying, I've got a guy on 16 and a guy on, in the basement, I'll, I'll call him. Yeah, it's it's applying a finger. It means eventually you're going to encounter war drivers in your elevator. <laughs> Will you riding the elevator war? It's a, it's a, it's you, it's basically using these established <laughs> fingerprinting techniques for something that may or may. I mean, it's location, but it's not like geometric. It's using fingerprinting to infer, to stretch what fingerprinting can infer. I mean, maybe you can infer infer other things besides four. I mean, we did this thing with with Reno where we we did we used a fingerprint to infer infer names of places. Maybe you can use a fingerprint to infer other other types of information as well. Yeah? So this is more, uh, this is more of a deployment prompt than a research and development prompt. But it seems like mobile phone carriers that run these GSM towers are very tightly, they, they really want a lot, whole, whole lot of control what people want to do with these things. And if, if they see that people could pop in these for location, I was wondering if you have any kind of any assistance from them because to do this. We haven't so far. Um, it could be that uh, it could be that we're we're small enough that we that we haven't evoked the ire from the empire yet. But um, <laughs> but uh, but um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like like I said in the beginning, they're they're really trying to they're really trying to make the money on this as a service. I mean, that's their business model. They sell minutes, they sell text messages, they sell things by the megabyte, by the, by the minute and stuff. And so they're trying to sell this by the query. And, you know, it's, it's possible that they're going, the cost model, the economics of it are going to change such that um, some of this, what we've, what we've provided here, could be provided by the cell providers if they, if they went a different way. And I mean, that's absolutely that's absolutely plausible, and I, I think that would be a, a very successful result, actually. There but there certainly are cell providers who are thinking of using Wi-Fi in addition to their own cell towers to location. I think there's even a larger question there of well beyond location of what are cell providers going to do with Wi-Fi as as voice over IP and other things come, and, and what are they going to do with WiMAX? How are they going to keep their enterprise customers happy while keeping their while still making money off their uh, off their consumers, uh, their, their regular Joe and Bob consumers. And I, th I think it's all sort of tied up in a large screen. I'm not, I'm not, I'm definitely not a marketing person or an economist. And I think that's, we start to get into that area where that, that really becomes the overriding factor beyond the technical things. It's not built in, but I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> you think the cheapest signal to receive would be a big AM and FM station, which to which talk megawatts? Sure. But, uh, that was what that was actually what the right spot stuff hmm. did. Um, I don't want to mischaracterize it. It did a lot of other stuff too, but that was that was exactly what that did. It did a low power, you know, stick it in a watch, hear the FM towers, know where you are within somebody said two hundred miles. I, I I was a little more generous to it, but um, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, maybe satellites the best. Even you know, you know, you're in North America by, <laughs> by the fact that you can hear Sputnik or something. You know, whatever. You know, you're on the Earth. All your cell examples were GSM. Does it work the same way with CDMA? It could, but it's just the 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 way the phones are right now. It's a stretch. Well, so one thing about GSM is you can only programmatically, legally get at the, uh, the, the current cell tower you're associated with, which is somewhat of a limitation. Whereas, you know, Wi-Fi, I could say, scan, and it will to return, you know, the 11 APs I can hear right now. GSM, I can only get the tower I'm associated with. In fact, I mean, our GSM numbers are pessimistic. If yeah. you had programmatic access to the whole list of uh, towers you can hear, then you can probably do better. So we haven't looked at ADCD based on Programmatically, yeah. you could probably get at the cell tower. Hard to imagine it doesn't have a unique ID. We haven't done it, but it, no reason to think it shouldn't work. Yeah, GSM is just because it provides, you know, that the phones that are GSM also happen to run a reduced version of J2ME that it was, you know, the path, it was. And frankly, you can't be taken seriously in Europe unless you have a GSM store. Yeah, it, it, it really, <laughs> we, we work with people in England and, and uh, lots of people around the world, Scotland and stuff, so. So GSM was those. Uh, politically, from our point of view, absolutely the way to go as well. So, 
Another one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the phone can absolutely see more than one. They're just, the, uh, you know, that's an example of them guarding it. They, they won't let you see more than the one you're associated with. Programmatic API doesn't give you access to phone. Oh, okay. Right. And you can actually sure, the phone can see it. It's a radio. Port. Actually, somebody makes a little gizmo you can snap on that takes your takes the serial port and sends it back in, and then you can actually get it, all of them. Yeah, you can hack it, but you know we didn't do that. But we know how to. We didn't do it because that's you know, what we did was kosher. And plus, that takes away again from the use yeah. your commodity use the commodity stuff. <laughs> no, it's, it's really easy. You can just download the stuff, and it works if you happen to have one of the stuff. And we really wanted to stick with that. But yeah, that would be a great enhancement. I mean, if this, if there was a, if there's the right business model to go with this, and the right people were on board, sure, you, we want, would love to scan for all the, all the GSM towers. It would great, it would actually greatly bring down those, you know, 150 to 200 meter accuracy thing. If you could see a, particularly if you could see a cross carrier, if you could see the T-Mobile and the AT&T and the, well, I guess Singular is the same now, but, um, and the, the Verizon. Yeah, I know you can do that. So you can go to you know, pick a network and it shows you a list of them. Yep. yep. And we actually, found, we actually found an API that said, well, if you pack this one little thing, but there was some legal warning saying, and if you go near this. Pack this thing, take yeah. out this resistor, you know, do this. No, 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 it was just software, actually. Yeah, yeah. Got dug up, I know. But we didn't, but we didn't do it. Got you're got absolutely this. right. But yeah, you're absolutely right. So, But we didn't do that for legal reasons. But Wi Fi, you have none of this problem. You know, Bluetooth, you don't have this problem either. So. There are no more questions I would like to. Thanks. Thanks for all the good questions and everything, and I'm 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 hope hope you liked it.